With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. Hope you all had it. A great weekend. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, April the 11th, year of our Lord, 2022, as the year continues to roll on. Hope you and yours are well, wherever you are across the street or around the world. Really glad you're with us. A couple of stories of turning down the noise of the news cycle that we're going to get to today. A uh, couple developments going on. There's a change in power in Pakistan. We're going to talk about that. We mentioned Schindler's List and the girl in the red coat uh, last week. Uh, There's another story revolving around Oscar Schindler and the movie Schindler's List in the news. The woman who actually typed out the list has passed away, has an amazing story. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, Also, an amazing story. Folks, don't ever throw away artwork until you check it out first. Some guys up in Connecticut found a dumpster full of artwork from a barn. Turns out it's worth perhaps millions and millions of dollars. We'll cover that story as well. Also, uh, Jane Bambar, professor of law at Arizona University. We're going to get into some really interesting twists on a very old legal problem. Things like the Fourth Amendment, things like search and seizures, get a warrant, as we talk about. Well, what about this geofencing thing where the police and law enforcement can get uh, electronic surveillance of a big group of people? in mass fourth amendment in a very hot tech environment uh jane bambauer on the program today to talk about that looking forward to that but first let's talk about the january 6th committee uh the new york times has a piece out and we need to apply some of our rules to it that we talk about here on herd tell the headline goes thusly january 6th panel has evidence for criminal referral of trump but splits on sending Despite concluding that it has enough evidence, the committee is concerned that making a referral to the Justice Department would backfire by politicizing the investigation into the Capitol riot. What planet do these people live on? Uh, It starts out this way. Uh, The leaders in the House committee, this is from the New York Times, investigating the Capitol attack have grown divided over whether to make a criminal referral to the Justice Department of former President Donald J. Trump even though they have concluded they have enough evidence to do so. People involved in the discussion said, remember that phrase. I'll come back right back to that in just a minute. The debate centers on whether making a referral, a largely symbolic act, would backfire by politically tainting the Justice Department's expanding investigation into the January 6th assault and what led up to it. Since last summer, a team of former federal prosecutors working for the committee has focused on documentation of the attack and the preceding efforts by Mr. Trump and his allies to reverse his defeat in the 2020 election. The panel plans to issue a detailed report on its finding, but in recent months has been regularly signaled that it was also weighing a criminal referral that would pressure Attorney General Merrick Garland to open a criminal investigation into Mr. Trump, uh, despite concluding they have enough evidence to refer Mr. Trump for obstruction a congressional proceeding and conspiring to defraud the American people. Some on the committee are questioning whether there is any need to make such a referral. Let's just stop right there. Uh, I just hate this sort of thing. There's, there's a couple layers of problems here. First, let's apply our rule. Uh, Basically what you have here is a news story. That is not a news story. Yes. It's talking about the news. Yes. It's talking about the January 6th committee, which is a newsworthy thing. But at the heart of it, this is a people involved in the discussion said piece, because that's all it is. It's hinting. It's unnamed sources. Now, those can be accurate, of course, but what's our rules that we always apply to? There's no such thing as a leak. So if people involved in the discussions are talking to the New York Times about this, it's because they want this to get out. They want this information to be partaken. Why? Why do they want it known that the January 6th panel is having trouble deciding if this is accurate, whether or not to do a referral. There's a couple layers here, but let's just deal with the facts as they exist. Um, The idea that this is going to politicize the process, this is already politicized. This process can't get any more politicized. Uh, There's no such thing and no version and no scenario 
to this process that is not going to be politicized. You don't think Donald Trump and his supporters are going to claim politicization no matter what happens here? Come on, let's be real and be grownups here. Uh, the January 6th uh, committee has a couple of built-in and eight problems. One is you have Congress itself, which if we're going to look at January 6th as a crime to be investigated, they are both the victims. Uh, they also have some people that were involved as perpetrators. They also have some people involved in trying to clean it up. That doesn't make for a very good investigation, doesn't make for a very neat and clean investigation. I am very skeptical that we're going to get sweeping reckoning from the January 6th committee, which is what a lot of people seem to think they're going to get from that. That's not what you're going to get. You're going to get a lot of raw data. You're going to get some subpoenaed information. You're going to get a lot of people saying a lot of things, but you're not going to get a clear-cut reckoning. There's no reckoning coming from the January 6th committee. Now, we are getting information. It gets more and more clear that the conspiracies and the plans and the half-baked, half-witted attempts to change the course of the election and change the course of the certification process on January 6th, all those things we're learning more about. But as far as referrals go, as far as criminal charges go, very skeptical any of that's going to come out of this committee. I know that's not popular. That's not what people want to hear on certain And I know some people want to think that, that it's in itself is politicized. But the truth is Congress is just not going to be able to get a reckoning here. They're going to give you information. They're going to give you some of what happened and insights into what happened. But there's not going to be any arresting of Donald J. Trump. There's probably not going to be any arresting of any of his underlings unless they are found to be blatantly lying, even though some of them have some real legal liability here, looking at folks like you, Mark Meadows. But that's not what's happening here. We've said from the beginning, you're going to have to temper your expectations of the January 6th committee. They're not really equipped to deal with what they're dealing with here. If you're saying that the riots that occurred on January 6th was more than that, that this was an attempt to overthrow an election, and there was elements of that, if you're going to say that this was planned by the president and his supporters, and there's definitely evidence to that, you're still not going to get what you're really, really looking for here, which is some sort of justice and reckoning for it all. That's not coming. What you better deal with is the facts that we can find out as it exists and push on from there. Why is this story out? People involved in the discussion said they're presaging something. They're telling you ahead of time that even members of the committee itself understand. They're not going to get that big ticket item that they think they're going to get, especially if the Republicans gain control of Congress come November. And that's the end of the January 6th committee as it's currently constituted come January. Of course, this is going to be politicized. It's already politicized. Don't look for a reckoning. Don't look for a clean-cut answer coming from the January 6th committee. You're certainly not going to get it from Donald Trump and his camp, and you're not going to get it from the people that are opposed to him. You're going to have to find that on your own. We all are. Look through the data, look through the evidence, and make up your own mind. It's pretty clear what happened in the big picture. Some of the details we may never completely know. Well, we have more than enough to understand what's going on on our own here. We just don't expect it to be a neat and clean narrative coming out of the January 6th committee going forward. More hurt tell right after this. Go back overseas. Uh, France had themselves some elections, uh, kind of what we expected, but maybe just a little bit of a bigger spread. Emmanuel Macron, who is the sitting president of France, is ahead after the first round of voting. He will go into a runoff with Marie Le Pen, uh, 28 points to 24 points, give or take which numbers you want to use. A little bit bigger margin for Macron than most people thought, but still, that's a lot for uh, Le Pen now. Uh, the thing you need to know about Le Pen, she is heavily, heavily tied to Vladimir Putin's Russia. She's been very friendly with him. He's been friendly with her both publicly and privately. There's accusations that her political party has gotten money through Russian-linked banks and has been bankrupt. She has what we would consider some very far-right views 
Uh, she is not good for freedom loving people. If she were to actually get power, this is something we want to keep a very close eye on. There are elements in American politics that would like to see her come to power. They are really, really digging these far right, very authoritative people. And they think it fits into their worldview. Mark those people. Well, keep an eye on these people who think Victor Orban of Hungary and Maria Le Pen of France are the next big thing that we should emulate. They are not. These are not good people. They do not have good policies, and they will not be good for freedom-loving people, which is what we're supposed to be. And if you want to start restricting freedom, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have to chat about that because we want the maximum amount of people to have the maximum amount of freedom possible. The policies of people like Orban and Le Pen, that's not going to happen. They'd be perfectly happy having a 51% majority dictate absolute tyranny on the other 49. That's not what we're about. Anyway, uh, Marie Le Pen, do your own homework. Don't take a talking heads for, word for it. Don't take my word for it. Just go dig up her manifesto she wrote a few years ago. Uh, there's a big piece in The Guardian about how she's remade her image to try to soften it to be more palatable. She still has a lot of highly questionable state statements and policies. She is not good news for freedom. She is not good news for the future of France. We hope she is defeated, but she's going to a runoff. You never know what might happen in an election. More hotel right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. This is going to be fun because this is a kind of an old story in law, but a new twist on it. We're going to go out to Arizona, another great Young Voices contributor. She's a professor of law out at the University of Arizona. That'd be the Wildcats, not that other one that does Sun Devil type stuff. Jane Bambauer, how are you, ma'am? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, feels like Arizona out here. It's a nice hot day out here on the East Coast for a change of pace. Summer's sneaking up on us. We're doing well, ma'am. Uh, interesting thing. You've been writing in the Washington Post. Um, about letting police access Google location data can help solve crimes. Now, we've seen this pop up a couple times. We've seen it with the in-home technology. We've seen it with data location, things like that. You've kind of got a new twist on it here. Uh, I'll just let set it up and let you tell the story, but are we going to really let Google start solving crimes, and is that a good idea? And give two examples, Professor. Give two examples. Okay. Uh, well, so I don't think it's I wouldn't say that generally in all applications, it's a good idea to have law enforcement knocking on the door at Google or Apple or any other tech company and getting whatever they want. This case, the reason I decided to write about it uh, is because it's an inversion of the usual way that police investigate crimes. And that, uh, and that matters a good deal. So let me tell you what happened in this case. And, and then I can explain why I think it's so different from uh, the other style of, of data access that police usually get. So in this case, uh, a man walked into a bank. He, uh, he shielded his face using his smartphone uh, from the, the, the security cameras. So the police knew that he used an Android device, which wound up being helpful. Uh, he went into a bank, he robbed it, uh, got away. Um, and the police tried to figure out who he was, the sort of ordinary ways, um, you know, asking witnesses and trying to follow up leads and that didn't go anywhere. So then they applied for what's, what's become known as a geofence warrant. They went to a magistrate judge. They said, okay, we know that a robbery took place at this location at approximately this time. We would like Google to share with us some uh, data, location data on anyone who had an Android phone that was uh, within, uh, you know, 100, uh, I forget if it's 100 meters of the bank uh, during this one hour time period. And so then Google gave them some data. Um, using that data without any names on it, the police uh, figured out that there were a, a few, fo three phones that might potentially be the robber. And they asked for an additional hour's worth of, of location data of those three devices. Uh, and then once they got that data, they were, they were able to home in on one phone that matched the other facts that they knew about the crime. And so then they asked Google to identify that one phone 
users. And that led to the arrest and eventual prosecution of, of, this, of, of this defendant, Chatry. Um, so the court had to decide whether that process that I just described was a violation of the Fourth Amendment, whether it you know, complied with, whether there needed to be a warrant with probable cause, and, and if so, whether that style of investigation uh, met those uh, conditions. And the court decided uh, no, that it was a violation of not just the defendant's rights, but all of the 19, 18 other people whose phones happened to be in the vicinity within that hour and whose data was, was provided to the police. Now, let's get some of the uh, nomenclature just real quick, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, because we have a lot of Internet lawyers. What does the Fourth Amendment actually do and do not say? I know we could you know, teach a whole semester or two or three or four years on the Fourth Amendment because it's one of the more contested things that's always getting tried in case law. But just basically, what does the Fourth Amendment give the average American in the average situation as far as protection from search? Great. OK, so the Fourth Amendment promises that we all have a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures uh, and and that. Um, a warrant can only be issued if uh, the police have probable cause to believe that the person that they're investigating, that they're searching, uh, was engaged in crime. So, um, so the word search and seizure, for that matter, both of those words have become terms of art because they don't just mean anytime the police is observing something, you know, that we might call that colloquially a search, but it doesn't necessarily count as a search under the Fourth Amendment. So police can, you know, they can walk down the street and they can look at, they can even follow people um, and, and, you know, they can be very interested and, um, and intentional about observing a target. And if they stay in public, that's not going to count as a search. Uh, so one of the things that this case raises is whether asking for the data from Google even counts as a search at all. And if it does, then we have to ask whether it was an unreasonable search. And then if it was, then it would require a warrant. <laughs> right. So now to make sure we get the rest of the nomenclature right, the geofencing concept, which it comes under a couple different terms, though, is basically instead of having one name on a warrant, which is what people traditionally think of, you go to the judge or the magistrate or whatever, and you get, hey, this person and here's why, here's probable cause, so and so. They're saying, well, here's probable cause. We need to look at an area or a group of people or a group of devices. This is kind of a different way of looking at this, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so we know that the police will need a warrant if they if they think if they have a suspect and they want to go search his home, for example. Every that's the kind of comp, uh, textbook case of when a warrant is required. You can't just walk into a home and and look around for evidence. We also now know, thanks to a recent Supreme Court case that police will need a warrant based on probable cause if they want to go to Google and say, hey, we think Andrew committed a crime recently. Give us the last 100 days of his geolocation records so that we can corroborate our suspicion. Um, that, in a, in a case called Carpenter, the Supreme Court decided that, um, that even, well, even though there was some other precedent that made it unclear whether they would need a warrant or not, that amount of sensitive data about who is, you know, about, about people's whereabouts um, constitutes a, a search. It's, a, it's an invasion of a reasonable expectations of privacy, which is sort of how the court goes about trying to figure out whether a search has occurred or not. It was less clear, though, whether this style of, of investigation, where you're just getting a little tiny bit of location data about more people, uh, whether that would follow the same logic as the Carpenter case. Yeah, talking to Jane Bambauer, uh, professor of law at the University of Arizona. Uh, where this starts getting really sticky now is what you just said. This looped in, you know, almost 20 people and their devices. When you're talking about privacy, when you're talking about, you know, reasonable search, now with technology, we have this whole nother layer of it because this data they're not going to the people for it. They're going to Google for it. And now you have things like user agreements and consent agreements, that little checkbox that everybody clicks on and never reads all the things on. That's where this gets really sticky in a hurry because now we've got multiple layers on top of the traditional warrant process, which is just the state and the individual. Now you got the state and the individual and you got this corporation over here and you've got legal boundaries that they've already signed. 
where do you even start trying to wade through that swamp when you're starting to try to get a warrant for 20 people's data that they also have a consent agreement with you? Like, I don't even know how to ask the question. That's how complicated this is. Isn't that kind of the core of the problem here though? Well, yes, yeah, sort of. If, if, if we start with an attempt to just, um, you know, take as granted everything that the court has ever said about when a warrant is needed and when it isn't, and then try to feel our ways to this case, it's going to be really hard. Um, but I, I prefer to slice through the cases in a slightly different way. So, that, so let me explain why I think that what happened in this case should be allowed, why I think the police should be allowed to ask Google for this type of data, even though they're not allowed to go to Google and say, hey, give us, give us the last you know, seven weeks of Andrew's data. Um, first of all, you know, it's worth mentioning that police have to do something to get an investigation started. So it's never a question of whether, um, of whether a, a crime is going to be investigated. The question is how. Um, and so police can, you know, of course, stand on a corner and see what 20 different people are doing. Um, they can see their public movements um, without, without initiating anything that counts as a Fourth Amendment search. What might surprise your audience is that what they can also do, with the exception of large amounts of location data, they can also go to any company with a subpoena, so not a warrant, but just a subpoena, which is basically a, a request. <laughs> and they can say, hey, give us records, any records that you have about Andrew. They can, in fact, it's actually even worse than that. Let, let me tell you about this weird puzzle where um, under the Bank Secrecy Act, banks have to, they're required to keep records on transactions. So if you have a bank account, banks are compelled to keep records and, they also must respond to a subpoena. Again, not a warrant, just a request. Um, and under the Fourth Amendment, all of that can be done without triggering a Fourth Amendment search. So if we think about what police already can do and have been allowed to do based on mere hunches or whims, um, it's quite, you know, it's probably quite shocking. Um, that's one reason I think many people, including myself, applauded the Supreme Court when in the case of Carpenter, they said, no, wait a minute, you know, we, I know we had previously said that police can access records that are held by a company without it even counting as a search, but this has gone too far. Too much of our lives is now documented in these records that companies hold, like Apple, Google, any of the tech companies. So that's great. But what's prof what to me is profoundly disturbing about that subpoena process where you just ask, you say, you ask for Andrew's, you know, seven weeks of Andrew's transaction or location data is that it starts with a suspect and there's no, um, th there's no duty for the police to abide by any kind of limiting factors in terms of when or how or why they would ask for any one person's records. And then they can go access very sensitive records. By contrast, this case starts with the facts of a crime. And so it is self-limiting in the sense that the police don't actually know who's going to be caught up in the geofence. It could be politicians, it could be, you know, it could be their friends. Um, it, it's not as useful as a tool for discretion. Uh, and for that reason, I think we should not treat all access to data under the same umbrella. We should think carefully about how we want police to solve crimes. Um, in fact, even in this case, the police first tracked down two leads that turned out to be wrong. In what one of the leads was that a woman called the police department and said, my ex-boyfriend so-and-so must have committed this robbery. And, uh, you know, it's not clear from the opinion what the police did to, to figure out whether that was true, but it turned out not to be true. Uh, and so that that was a that's an example of an individual totally innocent who wound up getting trapped up for a, at least a little while in a police investigation. And that's terrible, but it's also just part of what happens necessarily with police investigation. Uh, another lead involved a bank employee who, who, who knew somebody who drove the type of car that was used as the getaway vehicle or something that, that was suspected to be involved in the crime. And so it was just the right make and model and maybe color. There's no, you know, there was no other reason to think that this person was involved in the crime. And so the police had to like figure out whether that person committed the crime. So, so the fact that innocent people may 
wind up being implicated and that that's very stressful is unfortunate, but it doesn't make this process any different from, and actually maybe even less, it might, this process might be actually less burdensome to the innocent than the usual traditional style of investigations. Yeah. And we're going to get into that with Jane Bambauer here shortly. Uh, not only that, but this also cuts into how police investigate and some of the concerns folks about have how those investigations work, how that's going to change this. We're going to get into a little bit more of the case law background on this and how this case worked out. More with Jane Bambauer right after this as her tale continues. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We got Jane Bambauer. She's a professor of law at the University of Arizona. She's been writing in the Washington Post about geofencing, which is just a new high tech version of an old, old debate that we will have in perpetuity over the Fourth Amendment and warrants and searches and things like this. Uh, let me ask you it this way. You had just touched on the fact that this changes how p- police view suspect. I found it interesting when you wrote about it. You actually found kind of, I don't know if you'd call a silver lining in this, but in a day and age where we're very concerned about police conduct, police misconduct, uh, we talk about things like uh, police bias. You actually mentioned that if things like geofencing was properly attributed, that this could actually do a little bit better because you're doing things like de-identified data that takes some of the implicit biases out of it. Some of the things that we're very concerned socially about police work this could actually be a tool if properly used and managed and constrained by law. Big if there, but that could be a good thing in some ways because this is just raw data without some of those social things that we're so concerned about, isn't it? Exactly. The reason I write about on this topic is for ex- for precisely the reasons that you raise. I see some forms of technology-driven Um, police investigation as part of the police reform process. Uh, So I've, you know, I started in this area deeply concerned about, um, well, a few things that that all sort of tie in here. Um, For one thing, we have a clearance rate problem where we have these really, really long sentences in part because police aren't solving Enough crime, enough crime, there's not as much likelihood of, of detection and enforcement as, as there are in other countries. And, and clearance rates actually have gone down in the last few years. So, so that's a real, so, so we have a real crime problem, a real potential overpunishment, in my opinion. It's, it's a, there's, there's an overpunishment problem. And then at the same time, we also have this, this you know, potential for expansive uh, access to to private data. And so we might at the same time be, be suffering from privacy violations. So what I see potential in something like a geofence investigation because the privacy invasion is there, but it's, you know, in a comparative sense, it might be minimal or less bad than other traditional forms of policing. And as you said, it's, it's, it's more constrained to the facts of a crime and therefore less likely to, to be a, a, an avenue for unintended bias or even for just harassment and you know, abusive, um, abuse of, of power. Yeah, I'm talking to Jane Bambauer. Uh, one of the great bottlenecks, you're talking about all the problems in the legal system. One of the great bottlenecks in the system is pretrial confinements and things like this. Is there a way that some of this data could start being used so that we're not just throwing people into the system while we're still investigating them, that sort of thing? I know that's a little beyond the scope of the geofencing we're talking about, but there are people talking about, hey, if we use technology correctly, because that's really the the dirty, sticky end of the legal system right now where a lot of this bad stuff happens. That's where we start creating criminals instead of solving crimes. Is there a potential for some of this data and technology to start clearing up that end of the legal system where we can maybe have some of this data and not have to just have the whole weight of the court system dealing with every single little thing that's going on? Yes, yes. So there there have been proposals and um, some increased use in some counties of tracking and monitoring devices in lieu of pretrial detention and also in lieu of... uh, longer sentences uh, you know it, it's also a good probation on the other end of the <laughs> of, of the um of the process there it's also a good tool for probation rather than uh, incarceration and i completely agree with you 
one reason arrest is so terrible, so uh, life transforming is that is because of the incarceration that a, a, a person has, is taken away from their job, their family, um, before they've even been convicted. And, and you know, oftentimes the arrests are, are of course, um, are, are, are done without, you know, arrests are, don't lead to conviction. Um, and, uh, and then also, as if that weren't bad enough, we have a, a, a well-documented at this point problem where jail and prison has this um, ha has a criminogenic, as it's as it's called, effect. It, it, that is, it produces more crime, and that's partly because people are um, no longer have the sort of support and jobs and whatnot uh, from from the pre-jail life. Um, and there are other likely explanations as well that you know when when you have to when you're forced to associate with with people who um, know how to do crime, it just you know it can lead to more crime. Um, so yeah, there have been proposals for expanded use of, of, of surveillance and monitoring in lieu of incarceration. I'm all for that. The pri you know, there are privacy advocates that um, see it as dangerous because what starts as a mere substitution could then be broadened and we might start using, um, you know, if arrest seems less terrible, it might happen more often and uh, so that the police can monitor people. people. I, I see how there can be some unintended consequences down the line, but for right now, uh, I see so much upside from making that switch that I, I, I wouldn't worry until we, you know, get there about about downsides. Now, of course, that is on the uh, suspect end of the spectrum. We've talked about some of the positives that theoretically could come out of this on the law enforcement side of the spectrum of this thing. But, uh, Professor, as you all know, that all sounds great on the board in the classroom, but we're out here in the real world. We're grown folk. We understand that human nature is undefeated, and we got a lot of data. Uh, the police are human beings, and they like to push the boundaries of their authority. How do we, you know, they're not doing real great with the warrant system as it is in a lot of cases, as we've seen too much in the news headlines lately. How do we uh, realistically constrain things like this? Uh, because because of the high tech nature of this, some of the old models of restraint just aren't going to work. Some of the old check and balances are going to have to be updated some form or fashion, I would think. How do we make sure that the good parts are getting implemented without the bad parts where they're, they can get very invasive into people's lives in a big, big hurry in this with this technology? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, so I, I think there are a few practical limits that should be applied either by police departments themselves, and that that does happen, you know, um, um, police agencies and certainly um, the federal, you know, Department of Justice often, often actually constrains itself even more than than law would require. But there's, but I'm also hoping that this is an area where legislation could come fill in and actually take some pressure off of the courts too to figure out what's allowed and not allowed. The constraints that I think are important at at least at this stage. Um, are first of all making sure that a request of this sort is unlikely to capture way too many devices. So, you know, if there's a crime at a Justin Bieber concert, this is not the right tool, right? You're going to have just too many cell phones in the in the in a small area, and unless there's some other, you know, unless there's some other limiting factor that can can help. Um, ensure that only a, a small number, say, you know, fewer than 50 or something devices are, um, are tracked. Um, I, I have advocated for, it's not super popular, but I've advocated when we're, when we have a new technology for limiting its use to the more serious crimes. Um, the, the thinking there is, is that we it allows a sort of testing and proving ground and figuring out what what the problems are in a context where the crime solving if it does in, in, indeed turn out to be efficacious the the, the pr crime solving is most valuable to the public um so so personally if i got to design everything i would i would limit its use to um you know felonies that are punished at a certain level you know maybe not even all felonies um, the other thing I worry about um, is, you know, as I said before, I think one of the benefits of this style of investigation is that 
there's just not a lot of room for the police to exploit the tool. I mean, unless they're making up crimes whole cloth, um, there's, uh, you know, and as long as there's some process of confirming that a crime did occur at a certain area and the geofence is constrained enough to not wrap in too many people, uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to be as ripe for abuse. Let's talk about it this way, because we want to bring this to a practical thing. We, we understand that these things get worked out. We understand one of the frustrating things with technology moving so fast is we, we, we actually just have things now. It's like, oh, well, I wonder who's the first person to sue so we can get some case law on this is going to be. It's just kind of how the legal system works. What's the legislative side of this? Uh, is there there's obviously a path here where there needs to be some legislative oversight, both on the state and federal level. Uh, municipalities are probably going to have some variations on these things, depending on things. Uh, where do you see that going? Because that too is going to affect the case law, because as we've seen with other things, you know, the, the motto of the Supreme Court lately has been go, go talk to Congress about it. Uh, where do you see that going and how that's going to affect the case law? Is there a push for legislation in this area or is it something that's really, really lagging? And, the, and we're going to probably, unfortunately, with the way legislatures work, we're going to have to have some kind of a bad news event in this area for them to get attention on it. Yeah, well, the, the only legislative activity that I'm aware of are legislatures like like New York's that are contemplating banning this process entirely. Um, so I think geofencing has wound up being kind of categorized with things like facial recognition technology as something that just has an ick factor and legislatures feel like it's more politically palatable to just go ahead and cut off uh, police use. Um, so uh, in, in, in some ways that's a little bit of a challenge because if, if what I'm suggesting sounds right, like if, if we actually want to encourage some limited use of this style of, te of um, technology driven investigation, um, it, it's not clear who lobbies for that, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the police, departments themselves, maybe. Um, but on the other hand, if the police departments think that without legislation, they're basically unconstrained, then they probably won't. So, so I think, you know, that there's, there's a kind of political economy problem here that I, I am not really uh, an expert in and could not kind of forecast how this could work out. Let me comment, though, on uh, the your, your observation that the Supreme Court has too frequently uh, so hinted that they're just waiting for the legislature, whether federal or state, to, to get involved. I see that as a trend too, and I, it's an unfortunate trend. What I see in Fourth Amendment case law, it's always been a little bit of a hodgepodge. I mean, it's just, it's just very strange. Supposedly, we're looking at what reasonable expectations of privacy are, but then, you know, police can pretend to be other people and be your friends and, you know, they, they can do really strange things to get information, extract information out of you. And then they can't do even the slightest, you know, they, they can't, you know, even touch your doorknob or something, you know, but the case law is very strange. It's starting though, to get to the point where there isn't even a lot of grounding principles. I would love for courts in the lower levels at first and eventually sort of showcasing their thinking uh, as cases move up to the Supreme Court. To, to come up, to articulate the values, the core values that we're trying to preserve and how we, you know, how the legal system should, um, should, should, should balance them against the practical necessity of, of police investigations. And I just don't see a lot of that. Even Carpenter, the case that we were talking about um, where the Supreme Court decided you can't go get a hundred days worth of geolocation data, the Supreme Court wouldn't even say how many days of geolocation data you can get without a warrant, right? So their, their decisions these days have been so narrow, they're sort of gesturing toward thinking that there's too much privacy abuse, but are not giving us firm principles to, to kind of iterate on. Uh, we're going to have to have you back on because I really want to talk about this at some point with one of our legal experts like you or one of our other friends is, it's gotten to the point what we're talking about with the, the case law. We now have states specifically writing legislation to get it into the Supreme Court. I think that's a very I, pro or against or whatever. The specific, that, that's a really bad, that, that's not a good path we're going down with that. We'll, we'll have to have you back and talk about that in a water sense because 
uh, when you start having the participants in the system trying to short circuit the system, that never ends well. But that's another topic for another day. Jane Bambauer, outstanding stuff on the Fourth Amendment, geofencing, uh, technology, trying to keep up with case law. Appreciate your time today. Uh, we're going to definitely have you back. But until we get you back, let folks know where they can follow you, your social media, where you're writing at. This piece we're talking about, again, was in the Washington Post. We'll link it to it in the show notes. But let folks know what you have going on until we see you again. Yeah, okay. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Jane Yakowitz. That was my maiden name. And you can always find out what I'm up to by uh, via the University of Arizona's website and my faculty profile. Thanks. It was great. Yeah, Jane Bambauer and Yakowitz. That's pretty much a law firm right there. So, you know, it could have been something. <laughs> uh jane bambauer professor of law at the university of arizona thank you so much can't wait to talk to you again yeah i think we should dig into that that's a that's something that i think not very many people are talking about but it's going to really dictate some things over the next five ten years i'm afraid you tell me if i'm wrong but i i see that train coming and i don't like how it looks i don't know about you yeah no i agree it's not a good trend yeah um, we'll talk. go ahead well i was gonna say i i think some of the state laws like i'm a like like in terms of you know abortion restriction laws and stuff like that, some some of the state laws are designed to test whether there's uh, the Supreme Court is ready to make a change of, of rule. Um, that has its own you know perverse consequences. Um, but but another problem, which I think you're right, is related, but I can't you know I haven't thought through how, is this increasing narrowness of the of of the way that the Supreme Court drafts its opinions. So it used to be that the Supreme Court would write short opinions like 20 to 40 pages long and they'd have these kind of overarching value explaining their overarching values so that lower courts could try to apply them to new facts. Now the opinions are hundreds of pages long and they just say, well, we're not going to say much more than just that this case is decided in this way. And we haven't, you know, we reserve the right to decide a different way for almost any other case. Um, and it's, it's really an abdication of their responsibility. Yeah. The Roberts court is going to be a fascinating study 20, 30 years from now in a lot of ways. Uh, Jane Bambauer, thank you so much for the time today, ma'am. You were great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to Heard Tell. Two stories that we're updating that we've been talking about the last few weeks. Uh, we talked about trouble in Pakistan, what was going to happen. Well, now we know what's going to happen. Imran Khan has been put out of office. Um, the uh, Pakistan's a little complicated. They do have elections, but the military basically runs everything. So it's kind of uh, a filter, if you will. No prime minister has ever completed a full five-year parliamentary tenure in Pakistan, and Imran Khan looked as though... He could have well been the first. This is from the BBC. The reason his position appeared so secure, however, also it helps explains his downfall. Both sides deny it, but it's widely acknowledged he came to power with the help of Pakistan's powerful army and intelligence system, and now he's fallen out with them. Again, the army runs the country. Mr. Khan undoubtedly had significant genuine public support in 2018, but he also had the covert backing of what in Pakistan is referred to as the establishment or the military, the army has either directly or indirectly controlled the country for most of its existence, and critics labeled Imran Khan's government a, quote, hybrid regime. The support from Mr. Khan exemplifies itself a host in a different ways. During the 2018 election campaign, media outlets reported sympathetically on his opponents, had distributed, curtailed, with some candidates standing for election that were either cajoled or coerced into joining his party. He made by them, one defecting member of Imran Khan's party told the BBC, they were the ones, meaning the military, that brought him into power. They have now brought him down, uh, Imran Khan, out as the prime minister and the leader of Pakistan. One other note we want to update you on. Uh, remember back into the week, we talked about Schindler's List, the iconic uh, little girl in the red coat. That actress is all grown up and working with refugees. Another Schindler's List news notable item here, uh, Mimi Reinhardt. That's the lady who was a Jew, who was Oscar Schindler's secretary later on. She's the one that actually typed the list out. Schindler's list, she typed it. She was still alive until just now. She just passed away. She was 107 years old and living in Israel. 
Um, she kept it private most of her life that she was one of Schindler's uh, rescued Jews. She did talk about it on the record about the time the movie came out, although she refused to see it for many, many years because she said it was still fresh in her mind, even though that was 50 years after the fact. By that point, um, her, along with about a thousand other Jews, were saved by Oscar Schindler. Um, if you're not familiar with the movie, go watch it. It's a tough read. Uh, if you read the book, it's a tough watch if you watch the Steven Spielberg movie, but important uh, piece of history. But anyway, living piece of history has passed on uh, Mimi Reinhardt was the secretary who typed up Schindler's List. She was 107 years old, a very, very full life. God bless her and her memory. We'll do more her tell right after this. Uh, her tell show, you know, we always try to end on a good note. This is a fun one. Uh, there's this barn out in Connecticut, you see. And this contractor was paid to empty the barn into a dumpster. Um, the contractor, his name is Jared Whipple, was a mechanic from Waterbury, retrieved all these dirt-covered pieces of art from a dumpster, from a barn. Turns out they were artwork worth millions of dollars. Uh, Whipple uh, found out the works were by Francis Hines. This is from The Guardian, an abstract expressionist who died in 2016 at 96 years old and had stored his work in the barn Hearst Connecticut Media Group reported Heinz was renowned for his wrapping pieces in which fabric is wrapped around an object. His art was compared to that of Christos or Jean-Claude, who became famous for wrapping installations around Europe, including the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Paris. Heinz wrapped more than 10 buildings in New York City, including the Washington Square Arch, JFK Airport, the Port Authority Bus Terminal, art curator and historian Peter Hastings Falk said. The hundreds of pieces retrieved by Whipple included paintings, sculptures, and small drawings. Hastings Falk estimated the wrapped paintings alone would be sold at $22,000 a piece and Heinz drawings at around $4,500 a piece. Whipple showed some of the pieces at a gallery in Waterbury last year and recently decided to sell some of the art. He is collaborating with Hollis Taggart at New York City Gallery. And he said, quote, I pulled it out of this dumpster and I fell in love with it. I made a connection with it. My purpose is to get Heinz into the history books. He's also going to make a whole lot of money off it. The whole collection is thought to be worth millions of dollars. Don't throw away artwork till you get it appraised, folks. Moral of the story. That'll do it for her tell today. So glad you're with us. Hope you had a great weekend. Busy week ahead. A lot of, lot of stories that we're going to turn the noise of the news cycle down on. A lot of things to get to. Some great interviews coming up. Make sure you're subscribed and you like and leave comments wherever you're watching and or listening to the podcast from. We don't want you to miss a bit of it. So until we see you next time, we hope you and yours, wherever you are, cross street around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. I'll talk to you tomorrow on Her Tell. All the music on Her Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.